Hello everyone, this is Scott Roberts with Explore Scientific and this is the Open GoTo Community Live program with uh, uh, Kent Martz and Jerry Hubble. And yeah, I'll introduce myself again, Scott Roberts. Anyways, <laughs> hope you guys are having a uh, great day today. Um, not sure how many of you might have tried to see the comet uh, in, in the last couple of days. Uh, I did see it myself, it was beautiful. Um, rarely does Arkansas have a uh, absolutely clear, crystal clear morning. There's usually some clouds peeking out there somewhere, uh, but we had a great shot right at the horizon. And um, so I find Capella and just kind of drop straight down with the binoculars down towards the glow of, of the pre-dawn sky down there. And, uh, and there it was with a beautiful tail. So Probably, I mean, to me, visually, uh, probably had about a three and a half degree tail, something like that, you know, I would imagine, uh, just estimating. Uh, but it was uh, beautiful, and it's been a while since I've seen a comet that bright. So that was a lot of fun. Was it naked eye, Scott? Uh, when I pulled the binoculars away, yeah, I could see it naked eye. because You knew what you knew where to look. I knew what I was, I was looking at. The, uh, the, you know, the nucleus is very star-like. It's quite bright. And uh, so um, so that will be, uh, you know, something we're going to all be watching here um, in the next few days. So um, we do have some, uh, some topics we wanted to cover today. Um, and uh, this will be, you know, this, this has to do with all of us here in the company. And uh, it's the subject is is you know how far uh, will Explore Scientific go to do its customer service and and to take care of customers and uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that mostly as it pertains right now to the PMC eight uh, system um, but um, uh, Explore Scientific uh, to my knowledge is the only company that has ever won a torch award from the Better Business Bureau. Um, uh, that was something we're really happy and proud of as far as that achievement goes. But I think we're mostly proud of at the end of the day, knowing that we always give it our all to uh, help out a customer, um, no matter what the situation is. So, um, so right. Right. you know, I guess, um, uh, Kent and Jerry, you guys can give some uh, scenarios of, uh, of some situations where, you know, uh, we had a difficult situation uh, and what, what did we do to, to uh, help that customer? Uh, you know, I was on the phone this morning for probably 45 minutes with a customer who is uh, uh, having trouble understanding uh, the process of the configuration manager and all that stuff. So I'd literally uh, used Team Viewer, had him download Team Viewer. I got on his computer and I configured his computer for, him, configured his computer for him. Um, you know, and you've done that several do times. You've, you've done that several times, so you know, I've done it too. I've helped uh, right. customers one on one like that also. I'd say twice a week, probably. Oh. What, one and a half times a week to twice a week. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm on somebody's computer helping them out with something, either switching from serial to Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi to serial, or they couldn't get it to switch back, or they can't get it to connect uh, to their Wi-Fi, uh, and it's a firewall problem or a virus protection. Uh, you know, and I'm not a that's deep something deep else. Guy. That, yeah, that's something else to keep in mind. Is it's we do this not because, um, I mean, we want to help our customers do whatever, get them be successful, but, and it, and it's not necessarily because the equipment is hard to use. That's not what we want to say here. I don't think, <laughs> although it can be hard to use depending on your out, you know, your point of view, but it is, I mean, you know, you know, if, if it's I, not a hundred percent intuitive to, but again, I like to say, and Scott likes to say, I, I like to say it's not a toaster, and Scott likes to say it's not a hole in one machine. Yes. So it's neither like, a toaster like to say, or a hole in one machine. I like to say it's a it's a it's a hole in toaster machine. <laughs> yeah. So there is there is going to be a learning curve, and that's the way it is with just astronomy hobby in general. Uh, I think in general, most people think 
if you're if anybody that's been in a hobby for a while, if they see newcomers come in, they have to understand or they have the perception that you're going to be on a learning curve. You're going to you're going to have to teach yourself some stuff before you even become knowledgeable enough to do the basics in some respects. And it's it's not quite as bad today. I know that 20 years ago, the expectation was that every beginner had to learn the sky Oh, either yeah. through their naked eye, they need to be able to identify yeah, constellations. Your stripes, you know, you had to yeah, you have to learn your stripes, right. and and right. by star hopping, find, you know, how many deep sky objects, you know. So right, right, uh, and at that time, the the hole in one machine was a new go to system. Was a hole in one machine back then. Right. That's uh, right. but even even with a, a go to system, you still have to understand how it works and what it's doing before you can even get started uh, to use it effectively. Right. But the, but the point of it is we want our customers to find success. We can sit there and literally say, it's your machine. You've got to figure it out. Right. And, right. You know, periodically I have people who, who they'll say, no, no, the box isn't working. And I will say, uh, well, do you have an iPad? I said, well, yeah, okay, download Explore Stars to the iPad, and let's just see if it's the box, and look at split, it connects up. Mm -hmm. Well, that points back to their machine in some configuration, and, you know, um, it, it's a hard one, because I don't want to leave them out there in the cold, I want to get them running, but there's been a couple that we've had to challenge, and especially, especially what, the last two weeks, Jerry, a couple yeah. of situations we've had a challenge to solve the problem to figure out what's going on. I won't call it a problem, but to figure out what's going on and get them past it. Right. It's and, diff something's different about their machine than what's come before. And, and it's brand new. And we've gone all, we've done all the different things that we typically do to correct that. And the biggest, I think you discovered this, uh, last year early on, actually when you first came on, some of the issues are deal with the virus protection and the, uh, mm -hmm and the that type of stuff turning that stuff off and on firewalls firewall, firewall because i think the new firewall systems are looking for these udp transmissions between the box on the local network so explore stars uses a udp protocol and that's a streaming protocol uh and the security the default security seems to have been ramped up to where it blocks that stuff unless you explicitly tell it no this this IP address is fine this for UDP. Whitelisted, uh, basically. Whitelisted, right. So that's what we've run into the last year or so, I think. And it's becoming more prevalent, it seems like. or Two or three times doesn't necessarily mean a, a, a something's changed, but it's been a strong coincidence that's happened the last couple of weeks I just, more often. The guys that make virus protection, if they're making it so strong now, uh, thinking that, you know, most of their users are not adept enough to make a choice or to adjust their machine accordingly. Right, right. Uh, yeah, uh, we have a few comments here. Um, uh, Gary Palmer is joining us from the UK and of course Bergman Scooter. Bergman, you're with us almost every time, we love it. Uh, Dusty Haskins again with us, Chris Elliott, uh, joining us, Francis Walsh says hello. Uh, Mbante from Cameroon. Um, uh, and uh, Francis makes a comment. He says, you know where we start? At the finder scope. You know, so <laughs> there you go. Gary Palmer says, uh, most manufacturers expect their customers to have knowledge in astronomy. It shows by the instructions or lack of, or, or lack of them with all sorts of equipment. Gary, you're right. Um, uh, a lot of times, uh, uh, you know, when when you live, eat, and breathe uh, telescope equipment, um, you fall. You can easily fall into the lull of thinking, well, if they're buying this kind of equipment, they've got to be astronomers, right? So it's not like they're buying, you know, this uh, thousand or two thousand dollar telescope and know zero about it. But in fact. Those those people are out there, you know. They they are uh, they're they're just jumping in. But that's why we're here. This is why we have the phones. It's why we have live chat. It's why we're here talking live right now. Uh, and a big thing is a big change for us is we 
we've actually with the Access 100, we've we've uh, released to the public in the marketplace a inexpensive, sophisticated system for beginners that can the beginners can get into. Mm-hmm. So it's really ramped up the our game. Our need it's 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 uh you know made us ramp up our game in terms of customer support with beginners because they they know bare minimum about the sky. Well, uh, and we also we can also fall into the trap of when I say extension tube, I know what that means. And I'll use a piece of jargon that that it, people understand until they don't know what the heck it means. And you know, I'm trying to approach uh, re-editing and rewriting some manuals to be clearer about things like that. And we suffer from, you know, instructions or lack thereof. There are holes in our uh, instructions that I've become aware of because people ask about them. That's true. And so, yeah, that so was I, one of the previous polls we did on our manuals. How, and I put the, the poll on the forum is what don't you like about our manuals? Uh, and we got a good, uh, good idea of what that is. It's basically people want more and better information at, at a level that's, that meets their needs. And so I think that goes into some of the work that we're, that we're moving into Scott. Um, yep. Yeah. With the Explore Alliance. Yeah. So our Explore Alliance program, uh, we, you have, uh, you have just, uh, erected a groups.io, uh, portal for the, uh, Explore Alliance. And this will be, uh, you know, a member's place to go to, um, to, uh, you know, uh, learn from each other and to get, uh, you know, hands on with uh, different aspects of our, not only our community, but our equipment, our support, uh, our events, you know, our ongoing education programs, you know, that, uh, that uh, we're, we're going to be calling our mentor program. So, um, you know, that's, you uh, uh, in fact, I'm working. I know you're working on one of the class, one of the courses right now, Jerry, and and I am too. I'm working yep. on a course on uh, selecting eyepieces. But uh, um, you know, we're we're never afraid to take a question from somebody that says, you know, I just want to ask a dumb question because you know there really is no dumb questions. It's just that. Um, uh, you know, I guess you could say they're dumb instructors that didn't foresee that question. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Why would you ask that question? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, well, that's um, right. But Dusty Haskins is being very nice here. He says, I'm just going to throw this out there. After getting my Explore Scientific Telescope and getting to know you guys through these streams and seeing how passionate each one of you are about what you do, all I have to say is you got a loyal customer for life. Wow, Dusty, thank you. <laughs> That's, yeah, that's great. Yes, thank you, thank you. We're not. And we know you. We're not, we know you help spread the word too, Dusty. <laughs> we know you do that whenever you show off your telescope. Oh, that's cool, man. Thank you, uh, Mr. Thumb Thirty says hello. Um, I got people. Uh, Jody Ann says hello from California. Mike Lemus is here. Hello to everybody. Oh, Mike. Yeah. How you doing, Mike? Yeah. Um, uh, hey, Mr. Thump Thirty. Uh, I know the Nebraska Star Party Star Party isn't happening. Is happening? Shh, isn't happening? Are you going to the Nebraska Star Party? That's not happening. That is happening. Let us know. I know there's a few people are going to go. It's the Star Party that's happening. That's not happening. I, I hear that some amateur astronomers might be gathering. That's what I hear. So yes, yes, yeah. So it's kind of like uh, the skateboarders. You know, they knew that they weren't supposed to be anywhere. Where they were going, but uh, they would show up and, yeah, you know, it's, it's like the people in Los Angeles that were told they they can't do fireworks this year, right? Uh. <laughs> so, I guess the the Nebraska Star Party, Mr. Thump, the Nebraska Thar- Star Party is uh, come up in a couple of weeks at uh, Merritt Reservoir south of Valentine, mm-hmm. and uh, it's gotten canceled. However. Some people might go anyway because it's a state park and they can. So uh, who knows? But if you've never been there, the Nebraska Star Party was the first place that I've ever seen my shadow by the light of the Milky Way. Um, astoundingly dark. Do, uh, Scott, didn't Greg Bragg have that experience there a few years ago? I, well, I all of us that have been have, have seen how dark it is. Um, 
uh, it is uh, it's disorienting, um, you know, yes. into that dark of skies. Um, you can't find anything. Are, I found that, you know, I found that in California. It just yeah. the sky is just too filled with stars. I mean, too you many can't, stars. You, you can't see a constellation. Stars. If if the if the ground is is uh, maybe kind of flat or something, then you can actually see um, you can see by Milky Way light. You can see the shadow cast from the Milky Way. If you get into an area where the ground is kind of turned a little bit and it's already kind of in shadow, it's very bizarre because you're afraid to walk there because it looks like you're just walking into blackness, okay? Right. So um, I had that experience in uh, Rodeo, uh, New Mexico, and uh, it was uh, it was so dark uh, that I was afraid to walk anywhere, you know, so. So are you saying there's a case for light pollution, Scott? Is that what you're saying? There's <laughs> I'm, a safety saying case? I'm saying they should light that thing up like a parking <laughs> lot, okay? <laughs> It's a safety issue, right? It's a safety thing. Right, until I get set down where I want to be and then turn the lights off, you know. So, no, it's yeah. just, um, uh, you know, the, it's super dark skies are beautiful uh, uh, from, from many aspects. Um, uh, but, um, you know, if you're walking out there where there's like choyo cactus and barrel cactus and rattlesnakes, snakes and stuff like that, you know, then uh, scorpions. Yeah, you, you you just need to be a little careful. But you know, to get to dark skies, it's do the snakes. Do the snakes and scorpions there have super big eyes because it's so dark there? <laughs> <laughs> they have optical enhancements, you know, so they can see in the dark. I, so, I believe that they probably do. <laughs> so, to answer Mr. Sump asking question, are they planning on not showing up on the original planned dates? Uh, officially, the star party has been canceled. However, the state park remains open. And if people with telescopes all show up, it's just a gathering of people who showed up with fishing rods, right? Same thing. You can fish in Merritt Reservoir. You can go hiking on the trail around Merritt Reservoir, or you can all park up on the sand hills and observe stars at night at Snake River Campground. With no public bathrooms. With no public bathrooms. Yes. Right. So you got to be self contained. Yes. Well, or you got to be you're responsible for yourself. So Correct. they're probably no. treating, their, treating their citizens like adults. Is that what they're doing? Is that what you're saying? I don't know. Uh, nah, they, they just can't be organized in being adults. They can be unorganized adults. All right, moving on. We're getting into politics now. All right, no politics, guys. Gary Palmer says, funny what happens when you lose your alignment stars where it's so dark they blend in with a billion others. Yes, yeah. that's true. But it's, it's, it's awesome at the same time. It's hard, um, but hard uh, to know, we, we are we are uh, we we digress here a little bit. Um, uh, how far have we gone to help other people with with their systems? Now, if I'm, we're talking PMC eight, um, what's what has been the the most the hardest, most difficult problem to solve? Do you think? I think that one we just talked about with the virus protection, that's the hardest one. Now, in terms of... Uh, uh, like some of the auto-guiding stuff you guys... There's have. some auto-guiding, yeah. So early on, that was a that was a problem that came up. Uh, okay. We just we, we identified some cameras. Uh, early adopters were trying to use certain cameras that weren't meeting, that didn't match our calibration from the factory. So I had to, uh, in terms of figuring it out, it wasn't that hard, but it's a little bit of work compared to this. I mean, I had to create new firmware, custom firmware for our, uh, for people that had these camera systems that didn't, with a custom calibration, basically. It's, it's a real simple process. Yeah. It takes all of 15 to 20 minutes to do. But once, once uh, we started seeing certain cameras come up, um, and early on, it was right after we released it where we didn't we didn't have the pulse guiding. I didn't have that built into the ASCOM driver at that point. This was like in the first quarter of seven, 2017 when we first released the uh, mm -hmm. the mount. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I was working on getting the uh, pulse guiding implemented. Uh, and Michael Fulbright, I just wanted to remind you, Michael Fulbright is gonna is gonna come onto our program 
soon. Okay. Uh, I just got an email from him today asking when we would want him on here, but he's the guy that that uh, built the Indy driver uh, for the PMC8, and I worked with him to implement the pulse guiding feature in the Indy driver first, and then I and then once we figured it out and he tested it, then I put it over into the Ascom driver and released it. Mm-hmm. So before that, we had to calibrate cameras because there was no other way to auto guide with the system unless you use the ST4 cable. But now, I I always suggest people to to use pulse guiding if they're using the ASCOM driver to use pulse guiding versus the on camera setting on uh, on the guide software. Uh, it gets rid of a cable that you don't have to worry about any longer, and uh, and it just cleans things up. But there's one case where it's over in Europe that we're running into. It's using a standalone auto guiding system called MGen, MGen, M G E N. Okay. And uh, so anybody that has an MGen auto guiding system, which includes a camera and a built-in embedded computer system to do guiding, you have to use the ST4 cable. And and I will work with them directly to uh, to get the cali- to get a custom firmware for that. Mm-hmm. Does it vary from unit to unit, or would it be a case of oh, you have an MGen, here's your driver? No, it will vary. I've, I've got to go back. I think I've done three of them. I've got to go back and look at the data to see what the calibration values are. It, it, they may very well be within the tolerance that I'm expecting, so that we may be able to get it by with just one MGen firmware. But I always like to verify that with the with the data from the customer, and since I'm doing that, I might as well just encode their, their yeah. system. Right, right. Uh, so that's how that works. Great. Well, I, I you know, uh, I very much, um, you know, appreciate uh, all the great words that we get from customers and stuff about, you know, our customer service. But I always think that we have to like earn it every day, and we, uh, you know, we always have to kind of press ourselves to um, to stretch uh, to do a little bit better all the time because, uh, uh, right, you know. Uh, you can make you can make the equipment. Um, uh, you can try to give as much instruction as possible, but there's always, I guess, there's always going to be something left out. You know. Well, there's one other thing that I always do. Um, I try to explain why we made the decisions we did on the design because people always question, "Why did you do that? Yeah, why, why didn't you, you include this? Why don't you? Why don't this is a good feature? Why don't why didn't you do that at the beginning? It's obvious." You know, there's design decisions that we go through all the time, uh, especially when you release a brand new product. You don't, you got to balance the release date with what you have time and resources to implement. So you have to pick and choose. Uh, Periodic error correction on the uh, PMC8 is a prime example of that. Uh, That was a design decision I, I made explicitly, and I explained it to Scott. Uh, and we discussed it quite a bit early on, and yeah, my exactly. my engineering reasoning for that is uh, I think it's very valid. Otherwise, I wouldn't be thinking that. Um, uh, but and we've talked about it, I think, in previous shows. But that's an example of a of a feature that we decided not to implement. Yeah. Um, yeah, because there's just so many other solutions, you know. So. Um, Okay, well, I, I yeah. So, in gen- I guess in summary, we like to de- we like to explain why we do things. Also, not just this is what you have to do. That's true. That's true. And which I know we try to be as transparent as at all times. I mean, uh, about what we're doing, why we're doing it, um, you know. And uh, uh, if we run into a problem, we're we're right there to help, you know. So. Uh, case in point right here, we have a guy, um, viewer on YouTube, uh, Michael Whitaker. He says he's looking at using the PMC-8 with a laptop. Would I need to download the ASCOM drivers? Uh, we would recommend that, yes. Um, uh, you know, there's... Um, if you're doing astrophotography. Sure. That's right. But Explore Stars works on a Windows laptop. Wirelessly. Wirelessly, right. that's right. So if you're not going to use, if you're not looking at astrophotography, there's no particular reason to do it. There's no reason to not do it other than you get tethered to a a computer. But most assuredly, you're going to have to 
go onto our downloads page and download the configuration manager mm-hmm. so you can switch it from wire, wireless to wired and you're going to download the ASCOM driver or ASCOM and then download our ASCOM driver and we suggest picking the 3264 NEC PU version um, and then you're going to have to download the planetarium program of your choice. Uh, I use Cars to Seal because it is very simple and intuitive. We've uh, shown how to hook up Stellarium and CDC both in videos last week and two weeks ago. Um, it's a pretty easy thing to do. Um, watch, Find those videos and watch them. It'll walk you through the process. And if you can't figure it out, give me a call and I'll talk you through it. Yep. Right, right. Um, oh, oh, one other thing. And Michael, you're going to have to have an FTDI ch- chipset serial cable. A, a what? So FTDI, Frank Tom David Ida. Okay. Chipset. You're going to order it off, you know, uh, Amazon or somewhere. Figure you're going to spend 20 to 30 bucks for it. Um, but just a regular. Uh, USB to serial port will not work. You have to have the FTDI chipset to make it work. That's on the X. That's on the XS2 and G11. That's correct. On the IXS100 mount, it you, just a standard USB to mini USB cable works. Yeah. Right. Okay. okay. And if you if you're thinking about buying, I wouldn't hesitate. I'd go ahead and pull the trigger. So I think that uh, James, the astrophotographer, was talking about your choice of planetarium software. He says he uses on two different windows, laptops, no issues at all. Uh, could be talking about ASCOM drivers as well. But um, anyhow, um, Mr. Thump30 says, so would you guys not recommend Explore Stars for astrophotography? We say it's for visual. We have a number of users who do it. They work to get a very good polar alignment. Um, and once they have that down and standardize everything and learn to manage all of that, uh, there are people who are using it in the in the, the track mode to do two and one and two minute exposures yeah. and doing yeah, good work. It's very capable. It. Yeah, it's very capable. It, it wasn't designed for that. Let's just put it that way. It wasn't True. our yeah. primary mode for the system for explore stars is a visual right at the eyepiece type of function, but there's nothing to stop you. Of course, you can use the software like you wish. And we support that. We, we support your need for that. It's just not, uh, if we have a recommendation if for astrophotography, it's to use ASCOM. That's about all we can say, is we recommend you use ASCOM if you're going to do astrophotography. Yeah, because there are so many tools that to, to, to use your telescope that will play uh, through ASCOM. Right. You know, for the- guide scope, guide scope, guide camera, all those things work in concert. All that stuff. Yeah, Correct. yeah, that's going to be a requirement to use ASCOM if you're going to do auto guiding, probably. Although, again, in Europe they use the standalone auto guider, the MGen, like I talked about earlier. So you could theoretically use Explore Stars with an MGen standalone auto guiding system and a DSLR and a and a you know, long 300 millimeter focal length lens, and do very effective astrophotography uh, with Explore Stars that way. Okay, so here's a challenge for you guys. Uh, this is, um, he says, uh, Jao Pessoa uh, uh, Pariba uh, from Brazil. He said, he said, oh, maybe that's the name of the town, Pariba, or Pariba, Brazil. It's just seven degrees below the equator, almost impossible to achieve a precise polar alignment. Now, I have a, I have a solution for this, okay, but... Uh, uh, have you guys uh, come up against this? Do you have any suggestions? Well, so. there's a couple things. I, I guess what I want to say is uh, you can't really do an alignment, like you said, on the North Star because the refractive error is so bad. You need to do some kind of all-sky al- alignment, uh, drift alignment is what I would suggest, learning how to do drift alignment. Yep. And then I think, I think Kent's going to say something about how to get the mount to be able to point that way. So... 
he's below the equator, so he can't see the uh, North Star. So he's uh, suffering from south- Southern Hemisphere, not having any really good uh, polar alignment stars uh, to pick from. Uh, some polar alignment tools have octans trapezoid, but those are very minor dim stars, probably not visible from most cities. Um, at, at that point, out of the horizon, right? Yeah, exactly. In there. So the, the way you achieve it is you use your altitude to lower the mount as low as it will go, which is going to be like 9 or 10 degrees, if I remember correctly, and then shorten your southern leg to get it down to 7 degrees. And this is one of those iterative processes that after a period of time, you learn exactly where it needs to be for your viewing spot. And once you achieve it, you mark your legs and mark your spots on the ground so that you have a good polar alignment. Now, the other the method, way, you can lower that leg below where you need to be. Correct. And, and come raise, up. Raise yeah, right. I, would, I would add a little margin right. that way. Yeah. I, would, I would actually do that, yeah. provide a little bit of margin. Adjustments. Okay. Right. But now your tripod's on level. Okay. And so you should, your tripod is on level north-south, which yes. doesn't matter. You need to make sure it's level east west. But it's still on the level. Go to- so, so, so you know, you might have you might have some weight displacement issues. Okay, with with this. And so my 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 last recommendation on this. Um, uh, so both of you guys are going in the right direction with this. Um, uh, but the last thing to do is to use a cable and anchor your tripod down to the yes. ground with like. Correct. A turnbuckle, you know, uh, screws so that you can really tighten it up, and uh, and because you don't want to accidentally hit the telescope, and then the whole thing. Correct. Falls. It becomes right. Right. So you know, use tent stakes or dog screw stakes or something, and yeah. you know, I, you don't have to ratchet strap it down or anything, but you want to fix it so it it's not going to tip over. Yeah. Now the other the other thing, because you don't know where due south is, you can also use a compass. Yeah, uh, you know, a handheld compass with a base plate that turns, and figure out through a map or you know what the magnetic declination is, deviation from true north. So magnetic north and true north are different, and so once you figure out where true north is, you can align your north leg with true north. And I literally advocate taking a meter stick or a yard stick, putting it on the, a straight board, putting it on the ground, standing back getting it lined up with what I believe to be true north, then setting the tripod's north south leg, yeah. and in this case, true south, the south leg right at the end of the stick, then measure, moving the, the northeast and northwest legs so they're an equal distance from that board, and now you've got it pointed pretty darn decently due south. And at that point, then it's just like Jerry said, going through a diff, drift alignment in the method to where you fine-tune that process. Mm-hmm. So uh, first few nights, you're not going to be easy. You probably ought to just go out and do it and not plan to observe much until you master the process and and get it nailed down what you're going to do so you can do it quicker. Right, right. Okay. So let, let's move on to, to um, uh, you know, the second part of our show, and this is about uh, suggested suggested hardware and software. Okay, so let's just say someone's coming to us and uh, they're just getting into it, and they say, "Look, I don't have the computer. I don't know what I don't know what software I need, uh, but I I want, you know, I want to let's just pick it uh, an Exos two uh, PMC eight system, you know, and maybe they buy like our one twenty seven Apo." Okay. My, my first question is, what's your budget? Yeah. You know, how much money do we have to play with? Because that is a lot of the drivers right there. So with that, I say, you know, so it's going to be an Exos 2. They're going to go 127. Uh, I'll ask them, are you going to be always where there's AC power to plug into? Uh, if there's not, then our... Uh, the Explore Scientific power bank is specifically designed with plugs and to work with the PMC-8 system very well 
and give you a full night of, of viewing. Um, at that point, then it's guide cameras and what kind of camera, field flatteners, focal reducers. You know, there's a whole lot of pieces to the puzzle about what you're going to do. Are you wanting to do planetary? Are you want to do deep to do deep sky stuff? It, yeah. it, it really becomes a long process to figure out what each person needs. Right. I, I think uh, if we focus on the PMC-8 specifically, yeah. we do have certain recommendations for either tablets, uh, really mostly tablets. I know that uh, and uh, the Wes McDonald on the forum has created a list somewhere. I have to, I'd have to go find it on what tablets have worked, what people have reported to say, I can get my tablet to work fine. These are the list of tablets that have been proven to work. Uh, in general, as long as you meet a certain requirement for the level of the operating system on the tablet, iOS, it's going to keep up to date for the most part. The same with the Android uh, tablets. They're going to stay up to date, and our software works with the latest version. The, t the problem comes in when you buy an old tablet for used, let's say, on uh, cloudy nights or on other kind of whatever you buy it from, you know, it's a bargain. You paid 50 bucks for this $150 Galaxy Tab A that's from 2014. Or a $500 iPad. Right, or, or an iPad. That's right. That can all, But it can only run a certain level of operating system because it's been blocked out otherwise. That's the kind of information that uh, we need to understand. So... We have recommendations, and, and also in terms of tablet size, 7-inch, I think the minimum recommended size is 7 inches. 8 inches is better. You know, you can go all out and get a 10-inch, but it's not very portable and handheld holdable out in the field. So 7-inch is really the sweet spot. That's a very portable tablet that uh, you can put in your coat pocket maybe and, uh, and then use it in the field. Um, the buttons are a little bit smaller, so... If uh, if you're okay with that, then a seven inch works fine. Otherwise, I would suggest an eight inch uh, to make it easier to to use the buttons. Um, the uh, yes, that's this a seven is, inch. This is my Android with seven inches. Um, it's an LG of some flavor, and uh, it works fine. I have no trouble with it, other than the battery's dead now. Mm -hmm. So so in terms of that. Uh, if you have a question about a device, just, just contact us and we'll talk to you about it. Sure. Uh, and then you'll see also typically on the download, on the app download sites of Apple store or the, uh, Google play store, it'll tell you if you're, uh, when you download the explore stars app, if it's compatible with your device. So if you try to download something like, for example, people try to download the, the explore stars on their phone and it comes up and says it's not compatible. And that's, that's that's correct. It isn't really compatible. Uh, the same thing with certain tablets. If they're really old and you go to the Google store and you try to download it, it might tell you that it's not compatible also. Uh, so that could be an issue. Uh, in terms of PCs, uh, Explore Stars does work on Windows 8. If anybody's still got a Windows 8. In fact, it was developed originally in the Windows 8 arena and the version that we have now still available is is will work on windows 8 uh, going forward when we release the next major version of explore stars for windows it's not going to work for windows 8 anymore so um we'll probably leave both versions out yeah. there the, the last version of the windows 8 compatible version we'll leave out there and then you'll also be able to download the, the latest, or latest. To move away from an OS once they've mastered it. So. Right, right. So that'll that'll always be there. Uh, one of the interesting things we found also is that Amazon Fire tablets work also with uh, because it's it's to, it's basically Android, also. But there may be some special things with the specific Fire uh, tablet that you get uh, that may may or may not be compatible. I don't know. Right. Um, we're getting some questions about product here. Um, Jody Ann uh, says, I'm looking to move up and upgrade from a small Williams Optics Z61. What's the main difference between the ED102 FCD100 and the ED115 FPL53 for the price difference? You want to tackle that one, Kent? 
No, but I will. <laughs> um, the main difference is, excuse me, the FPL 53 glass has slightly better um, transmission in the red to infrared spectrum. So you, um, which basically talks, is talk, we're talking about nebula. At that point, you're getting a little bit more red light, <coughs> excuse me, uh, onto your sensor than you would otherwise. Um, that's the most significant difference. And we have a chart. Uh, if you go to explorescientificusa.com and um, go to the triplets page, there's a button underneath the chart. Come on, computer. Go to the APO triplets series and go down between the two diagrams of doublets and triplets. There's a little please click here. If you click there, you will get a chart that shows the analysis of uh, the refractive index, the Abbey number, uh, the dispersion index, the refractive index, uh, and you can go through and, and study what those are, and, and it's slightly better in the red. Um, price difference? I can, I can bring up that page. Oh, yeah, absolutely, Jerry. That's right. So price difference, you know, that's a question each individual has to answer because it becomes, you know, people ask me, what's the best IP? Mm -hmm. That's a hard. That's a tough one. Yeah, that's I, that's a very personal. Your eye, your telescope, your conditions, the yeah, thing you right. look at. Yeah. Okay. Do you see that page? Yeah. Yep. The page. Scroll right. up. Scroll up just a little bit. There you go. Let me zoom in again. Yeah, see the refractive index between um, FCD 100 and FPL 53 is really, really close. There's a big difference between FCD 1 and those two others, but uh, uh, very difficult oh. for, the, for the human eye, for the human eye to tell the difference between FCD 100 and FPL 53 glass. Uh, although I'm sure there's some people that might say, uh, "Sure, you got to move that." There, there we go. Yeah. Um, the numbers are very, very similar. Very similar. Very similar. So, I don't know if we answered the question or now, not. The ED102, the 115, of course, is larger aperture, so you're getting more aperture. Yes. Your money, you're getting a little faster F ratio uh, in the system, um, and you're getting a larger focuser. So, yeah, you're getting a three inch focuser versus a two and a half inch. So there's a hardware focus. difference, a glass difference, an F ratio difference, an aperture difference. So. Scooter <laughs> Bergman Scooter says. 92 degree ES 17 or 17 millimeter uh, would be the one he recommends, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. Um, so uh, let, let's move on at this point. We one of the things that we wanted to also touch on was uh, weight capacity of our mounts um, and. Uh, you know, so that's it's a it's a constant question, and uh, one of the things that um, that I wanted to put as far as the spec uh, in in our products is, you know, what is weight capacity? Is weight capacity to the point where you load on so much uh, equipment onto the mount that the mount just breaks or the tripod collapses under the weight, uh, or is it uh, really, uh, when does the mount behave differently when you're doing astrophotography, okay? And, and so weight capacity, when you're asking the question, you're really asking, you're asking a, a question about astrophotography. You're not asking, will the tripod and mount hold the telescope? And in most cases, you can, you can put a, vast amount of weight on uh, over on top of a mount and a tripod and it's going to hold it okay um, but um, you know uh, what does that pressure do 
to the worm wheel and the worm gear as they're being squeezed a little bit tighter now, okay? Um, you know, so it's not, it's usually not a scenario where you're burning up motors because you can't burn up our stepper drives. Um, you know, you're not gonna burn up our electronics uh, because of resistance. Um, that's just the way our system's built. Uh, but uh, you will change the characteristic of what uh, the, the, uh, the drive uh, smoothness might be like or the periodic error, you know, periodic error types of uh, characteristics. These kinds of things do change when you go past a certain level. And so uh, one of the, um, sadly in our industry, what, what is often put up there is that, uh, uh, you know, up to limits, okay? And what does up to mean, okay? Uh, so <laughs> one time, right. uh, you can see it on Facebook, uh, Alex, yeah. Alex Sanchez and I uh, took one of the Exos 2 mounts and we put 90. about 90 pounds on it, okay? Now it's not rated for 90 pounds, but we showed that you could still slew all over the sky. I would say it's not rated for 90 for typical use. Let me put it that way. <laughs> That's true. That's true. It, it was able to we slew, were, like you were we just saying. We had that it whole was counterweight rod filled with counterweights, and we were putting weights up on top of the telescope and everything just to show that the, that the drive, the PMCA would still drive it. It would still track uh, things in the sky. But I can guarantee you that it would not perform as well uh, when it's more at the astrophotography weight limit of the mount. And so we do give, we usually give a couple of uh, weight capacity ranges on there. And one of them is just flat out uh, what we recommend if you're gonna do uh, visual work, um, not astrophotography, and then an astrophotographic weight capacity. Scott, does anybody else do that? Maybe. I know. Maybe, but <laughs> maybe well, kind of because they give, you a, a number. they give you a number and then you have a thumb rule. I, I always use 70% as a thumb rule, but some people well, use 50%. Well, but see, that's the point. They don't state nowhere that I've ever seen states that, you know, we recommend 60% of this weight capacity for astrophotography. And what I've seen happen is people think that weight limit is the weight limit, and then they find out that there's really this osmosis rule of thumb they're supposed to pull from the ether that's somewhere between 50 and 70 i think and it's now they're left yeah i think so. it's interesting when people say it should be 50 percent that that forces you think about what that does to the market that gets in the mind of the market that says okay this can only hold 50 percent of its stated weight for astrophotography i guess i need to go to the next higher dollar mount to make my astrophotography effective mm -hmm. so that <laughs> to me, that's kind of like a little bit of an ethical dilemma. You know, how do you drive sales to your higher end mounts? Uh, you know what I mean? Right. Well, you know, the customers do it themselves. I mean, there's, uh, right. there's a comment in here. A guy in my local club said a good rule of thumb is to get a mount that has double the load capacity that you're mounting. Okay. Right. 50%. 50% right. <laughs> right. <Yeah>. So. <laughs> So, but what could you get away you know, with? Now, we we see people using the IXOS 100, and you know they're putting stuff on there that we never dreamed that they would. They're using it at a hundred percent of the visual limit that we right. suggest, or even over. The limit no, used in faster photography. So go. We, we we know of one person that's got thirty five or thirty six pounds of telescope and counterweights yep. on an Exos 100. Right. Right. Do we recommend it? No. Okay. Uh, what I say is, your car, your car has a speedometer. The speed limit may be 70 on the interstate where you live, but you can drive your car faster than 70 if you choose to. Yeah, and, and, and you'll also, pay the consequences. Right. No, well, you maybe not because you've got the skills and knowledge to do it effectively. That's the whole key. Right. No one where the have, police hide. If you're experienced, if you're experienced and you know what the problems are in this this configuration then there's nothing to stop you using your skills and knowledge to do a great job doing imaging with that. Like, J like JR has proven. Right. That's true. For planetary. Tim Myers says, if I remember correctly, your suggested weight limits is for the scope and the counterweights are not counted. Is that correct? 
That is correct. We, our statements are positive looking forward statements that says telescope and astronomical gear, not including counterweights. Yeah. So we try to make it clear. Here's what our maximum recommendation is of telescope and astronomical gear, guide scopes, onboard computer. If you have one mounted, uh, field flattener, focal reducer, filter wheels, focusers, all that stuff adds up on the Exos 2 with PMC-8 for astrophotography, 28 pounds of stuff, yeah. Yeah. not counting counterweights. Jerry, why don't you bring up that uh, video? I think it's on YouTube on our channel. It shows Alex and I loading up an Exos. Okay. Let me see if I can find it. It might <laughs> no, take yeah, a I mean, minute. Just, just how, how crazy it can get. It's very humorous. So, uh, if it's yeah, we don't have to watch impressive. the whole thing, but <laughs> but you can bring it up to uh, maybe the last yeah. So so Tim and or something. Tim and Dusty both said that they don't know of anybody else that states it the way uh, that we state things um, because I mean we're that's a decision. Oh, Scott the, I want to be very transparent about it because. Look, if we're going to be selling equipment, let's just say that we sell equipment only to our friends, okay? Only to our best friends. How are we going to how are we going to uh, describe it, you know? Yeah. We want to tell them the real deal, right? Right. So, and this is this is the real deal. It's transparency. I mean, the, the the you know, if we have warts, we've got warts, okay? If we if we if we uh, uh, got, you know, a better performance than Hallelujah. But, um, you know, uh, the people, you know, when you're into this hobby and you're building your system, you know, you really need to know uh, the the performance levels and the limitations. So. So, Scott, um, why don't we advertise that we're um, uh, that that our weight loads are ISO 6000 compliant or 12.2 compliant or something? What I mean, because. Isn't there an industry standard out there for all this information? No, sir. No, sir. You mean the, you mean there's the, no the industry standard is actual field performance. Okay, that's the industry standard. So, so, so know, there's there's no machine, uh, uh, you know that uh, that mount makers use to test the uh, capacity of things. You can do some things in uh, programs like SolidWorks and stuff like that. Uh, where you can see stress loads and stuff like that. But we're talking about stress loads that are so minute, okay, uh, because you're trying to drive to an accuracy of less than two arc seconds, okay, maybe sub-arc second. Uh, that's almost, um, you know, I mean, if you just press your finger on something, you can affect that kind of change. So so, so these standards are basically built by experience and you know, beta testers who, who we send things to and right. they come back and say, we think it's 40 pounds or 20. So, or what, so right? I mean, a couple of examples where we haven't raised our numbers to look better than what we're currently saying uh, is the IXS 100 users who are using it way beyond the, uh, uh, the recommended uh, uh, weight capacity, okay, um, for astrophotography. Uh, there another one uh, we had um, on cloudy nights. Uh, there was a thing about our 120 degree nine millimeter eyepiece, and they had measured it to be more than 120 degrees apparent field. But I'm not going to go and change those numbers because 120 degrees is what we were designing for. Um, so, so it's kind of like it's that. it's better to be that direction if somebody measures <laughs> yes, to say it's it only is. 115. Better be understated than right. overstated. I'm having a hard time finding this video, Scott, Are you? for some okay. reason I, on the on the, uh, on the Explore Scientific YouTube channel. Yeah, I couldn't. I looked for it I know, a while back, couldn't find it. I don't know. Well, Scott's, Scott's going to try and find it on the Facebook because that's where it was originally. Is that where it was? Yeah, it was. It was on the Facebook somewhere. Okay. And I'm saying the Facebook to be humorous for those people who... Yeah. So, anyway. Oh, Dusty Haskins says, I'm guilty of seeing how fast each car I've owned goes, but for some reason, I never want to push my mount like that. Well, 
you know, pushing your mount past the limit is not going to be as nearly as painful as getting caught, say, doing 127 in your pickup truck. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. You know, somehow you might I'm do thinking, some jail time over that. <laughs> yes. So, well, good. Got, I can't find it either, guys. We'll have to uh, pull it up another time. So, um, so let's uh, let's let's um, uh, we're going to wrap up the show, uh, but we wanted to do something a little fun here, um, and that is that we wanted to have a contest. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, that that I mentioned when we first uh, started this was the comet. So. Uh, here we've got this beautiful image. This was done by Chris Schur, uh, and this was tweet. This image was tweeted by uh, Dave Iker of Astronomy Magazine. Um, I guess Chris had uh, sent it over to him, and it's a beautiful image shot with an Explore Scientific AR one fifty two. This is not an Apo. This is our six inch f six point five uh, doublet Acromat, and. Uh, did a beautiful job with it, um, but uh, you, uh, uh, Kent, you wanted to um, um, propose so got, a question out there. So, so we have two questions. Two questions. Okay. Okay. And so, are you giving uh, away what two? Two good. Separate, what do you got? Two, okay. So one prize, and is a um, set of the buttons, the stick-on buttons for use with a tablet in the pmc8 system okay so, so you have tactile buttons okay. yeah tactile buttons um and and i'm going to just do this if if you don't want the buttons the prize will be a uh wiltarian uh multi-latitude planisphere we'll do it that way so we have buttons that stick on so you have tactile feel on the pm on the on a tablet mm -hmm. and if if the winner doesn't want that then we'll give them this uh Cinema Planisphere. Okay. okay. So here, here we go. The question is, Neo, Neowise has discovered, uh, at last count, 195 comets. But there's been something else out there. Uh, SOHO, the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, that's discovered a whole lot more. How many has SOHO discovered? Now, this was in the news the last couple of days ago, so people are keeping up may know this off the top of their heads without Googling it, but I suspect there's a bunch of people going to the Google right now trying to win themselves a, uh, uh, a prize. So, uh, Scott, it's up to you. Yeah, just to, just as a note, I just posted the link in the uh, Skype chat for that video. I found it on Facebook. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, James, the astrophotographer got it, it looks like, Scott. Let me double check here. Yep. <laughs> yes, he did. So what's the... That was quick. Uh, the 4,000. 4,000 comets. 4,000 comets. Wow. Wow. Correct. And I didn't look up how long it's been up there, but it's Soho's been up there for a while. Yeah. Okay. So, um, well, it's got it. It kind of cheats. It's, it's there looking at the sun all the time and that's the hardest place to find any comet. So it's right. got a, an advantage that yeah. we don't have. And the because other all the advantage that it's got is, is it's got tons of people that are constantly, uh, looking through the data, uh, right. to, uh, to, to mine out discoveries, you know, so this is, this is uh, citizen science uh, a lot of times where those comets are being discovered on, on SOHO. So this is really cool. Hey, James, send me your um, contact information. Send it to service at explorescientific.com, S-E-R-V-I-C-E at explorescientific.com. Uh, put, put attention, Kent. Uh, and prize in all capital letters, so I will see it, and uh, uh, I'll get that dispatched out to you. Tell me what you want, either the buttons or the uh, uh, planisphere. Okay. And uh, question number two, and this is for, a, again, planisphere of the buttons, whoever, whichever one you want. 
Um, the question becomes, we've been talking about Neo Wise and we saw those pictures. Yeah. What does Neo Wise stand for? NASA comes up with some great acronyms. <laughs> what does Neo Wise stand for? Ready, set, go. Okay. I suspect there's a lot of people. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. How long does it take to type and search to look for it now? And then you got to copy and paste it into the chat, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So this will be interesting to see how long this takes. Or I'll throw these in for, for this prize as well. This is only for the Neowise. Um, if you want a set of the Explore Scientific. Um, those are leggings? What are those? Yeah, uh, head leggings, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> head, head leggings. Head, head leggings. <laughs> that's, a, that's a new term. You go hashtag head, head leggings. Yeah. Hashtag head leggings. There you go. Just leave it like that's that. That's what it looks like. It looks like you're pulling pantyhose over when your face. When you to pull off your next bank robbery, okay? Yeah. This is the Explore Scientific bank robbery kit. Oh, yeah. Did you, did you see uh, the movie uh, Raising Arizona with... Uh, oh, it's my favorite movie. <laughs> that's a great movie. I love that movie. Yeah. <laughs> we got, yeah. got that one and this one. Me and so, the kids, man. We love that movie. That's a head legging. So hashtag head legging. Head. <laughs> Has anybody got it yet? No, I don't see it yet. Oh man. What does Neo Wise mean? Uh ah, Bill Black off of Facebook, the Near Earth Objects Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer. Awesome. I like the bill. part that they use in it. That yeah. rings a bell to me somehow. Yeah, but yeah right. It's it, very cool. Does, does my hair look okay after I pulled the yeah. gator off? Is you know, I have to so. put mine on straight every morning. You know. Okay. Hey, yep. hey Bill, same thing. Send me uh, uh, an email with your contact information and tell me what you want, and I will get that dispatched out to you. Thank you, guys. Okay, well, that's uh, – oh, I guess I can do this here. Uh -oh. The video, Scott. We want to see the uh, comedy routine you and Alex did with the 90 pounds on the Exos. Okay. Drive, basically, we want to see you driving a. So let's see. Let's see. This is driving 120 in a pickup truck. Well, you can share it, Jerry. Yeah, I can share it. I'm on my. I've got it on my desktop yeah. right now. So let me go ahead and do that. I don't know how do you want me to go forward? Yeah, let's go forward here. All right, there's the system. Right. This is a this is an AR 152, uh, which is our heaviest, almost our heaviest refractor. Stop stop right there, Jerry. Just right there. Yeah, let's stop right there for a minute. <laughs> we were finding counterweights all over the building. <laughs> Some of the counterweights look kind of ratty, but uh you can see how much weight we're putting on this thing. It's crazy. That's uh, 10, 20, 30, 40 pounds, actually 44 pounds. Each each one of those counterweights is 9.9 .9 pounds. There we go. 8.5, 8 whatever. 84.5. Well, yeah, those are, the, those are the first light ones. So we put counterweights. Oh, look at that. Um, Stop it, Jerry. Stop it right there. Back up just a little bit. So you've got one, two, three, four. Up too far. Okay, one, two, three, four on the bottom. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, two point two pounders on top, plus the telescope. Plus the telescope. Oh, right, up here. Yeah. yeah. All right, so go ahead. Let's let's see if it works. I think we already had a spoiler on there. It does work. <laughs> Look at Scott laughing. Look at the grin on Alex's face. I know. I know. 
That's a hell of a uh, control system on there, too. <laughs> yeah, that's what I've heard. And so we're getting ready to have a, a leg strike right now. If it has a leg strike, it's no big deal because the stepper motors simply let go and the magnets, you know, torque overcomes it. And you know, Yeah, the, the inertial load. Forward. So there's an, in the firmware, I handle the inertial load uh, for that also. So Mr. Thump 30 says, but would you day in and day out uh, f photograph with all that weight? And the answer is, it'd be fun to try it sometime just to see yeah. um, if it would, would happen uh, and what we could do with it. But no, you know, that's why we say 28 pounds of yeah, camera that, gear. That much counterweight on it. Uh, I mean, this is not, that's not designed as an astrophotographic type of thing. I just wanted to, to demonstrate that the, that you could load this thing up to all the weight that could possibly put, be put on that mount with our counterweights. Okay. So, so Jerry, uh, go ahead and run it to the very end. Cause we say how much it just real quickly. It says how much is on there. Cause we added it up. I think it says at some point it's like it's either 85 or 90 pounds. I may be it wrong. It was 85. It was back here. It showed. Was eight. it? Okay. Yeah. 85. Yeah, we, already, we already. Okay. I'm just set. All right. Yep. Anyways, kind of like one of those videos that most manufacturers would never make because they don't want yeah. to know their mount being used that way. Okay. But, uh, um, but I like, I like testing our stuff to the point of failure actually. So, and, uh, well, and underwater and everything else and moisture and right. it's a tough, uh, it needs to be reliable. It needs to be, it's not that we're, we're designing, we're designing it with margin. Let's put it that way. And that, that keeps it reliable and, uh, and helps it, helps it, uh, extend its lifetime. Uh, yeah. the incremental cost for this is, you know, if you really design it well, I think the incremental cost for, for getting this margin is really not that much more and people appreciate it. It just shows how robust the system really is and how critical balance is. Yeah. Now, some of the comments there, they say would uh, kind of like people standing on the wing of a Mooney, you know, uh, if you're a pilot, you know what a Mooney is. Uh, James, yep, astrophotographer yep. says it gives you peace of mind with your purchase. You know who else it gives peace of mind to? Me. <laughs> and, and Ken and Jerry, because, you know, we don't want, we don't want to see our equipment come back because it was marginally designed and uh, we have to deal with it in customer service. Uh, you know, we'd much rather have, uh, you know, that tool that will last you for a long, long, long time and, and really take that beating, you know. So uh, amateur, amateur astronomers, for the most part, do the very best they can in taking care of their gear, but they're using it outdoors. They're traveling with it to their dark sky sites. They're setting it up. They're tearing it down. They're reconnecting things, unconnecting things. You know, it's, so it, it, just, uh, it just makes sense to have some equipment that, um, you know, can really handle the, the abuse. So, uh, The use. I, let's not call it abuse. No, there's use. That's... <laughs> well, well depends. And you have a no-fault... You have a no-fault... Uh... On some of our equipment, you have a no-fault guarantee also. Right. Right. And we have uh, Redbeard uh, WS6 on Twitch. Thank you for watching us on Twitch out there. Uh, he says, Twitch rules, clear skies. So that's awesome. So anyhow, uh, so here's the challenge for all of our listeners and for all of us is to get up early, okay, if it's not if it's not raining, okay, and it's not cloudy, um, you know, don't 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 wimp out and uh, not go see this comet because it's beautiful. What, uh, what time, Scott? What time before dawn? No, sunrise? Uh, I was out this morning at about four thirty. So, um, uh, but that might, that might be a little bit different whether you're kind of north or south of us. We're down in the not the deep south, but pretty far south in the United States. So thirty six latitude thirty six <laughs> yeah. north. 
That's right. So if you're more north, you're, you know, so. So it's right before twilight, it, you think? It, right it, before, before twilight? Before the sun rises, find Capella, okay? Come down with your binoculars and just kind of go straight down and then sweep just slightly north. It's moving, but it's not moving that much, you know? And I think that we have, if uh, memory serves me right, we have about until the 11th, until we um, uh, have to start uh, uh, switching to watch it in the evening. But don't wait for that to happen because if you get clouded out for all the evening viewing opportunities, you're going to kick yourself. So yeah. this is a great comet. It's beautiful, um, beautiful long tail. And, uh, you know, uh, if you have, have some camera gear, you want to get pictures of it, uh, you know, go for it. I think you're going to really be happy with what you get. So. So, hey, does Tim Myers ask which comet he got here late? We're talking about Comet Neowise. Comet Neowise here. I'll show you has, so once again the photograph that was done by Chris Shore with the uh, Explore Scientific AR 152. Um, and, uh, you know, the, that uh, uh, Dave Eicher from Astronomy Magazine tweeted this image. I got it in my Twitter feed and I thought, wow, this is beautiful. So, uh, so this is. To be clear, that's a, uh, uh, with an AR, that's a doublet, right? Yeah, this is an actor. So, this is not one of our. Right. So, right. Yeah. So how come it doesn't have any chromatic aberration? It does have chromatic aberration. It just makes it look purtyful, huh? <laughs> well, in, on deep sky objects and, um, uh, you know, on deep sky objects, where you don't have enough light intensity to to uh, show the you know the the blue okay that would be the chromatic aberration in that scope um, you know it's it just has to be something very bright so for instance like a super bright star like uh, Sirius or you know very bright star would start to show um, some of the chromatic aberration you can use some filters though to cancel it out. I don't think he used any filters on this shot here. Uh, you're looking at faint stars in the background and kind of a nebulous uh, view of a comet. And so it's, you know, uh, shooting with an AR in that regard is, is uh, perfectly fine. And if you uh, search Chris Shore astrophotography on Google, you'll find his site and uh, find his comments about it, so. But anyhow, uh, you guys have a great night. Thanks for hanging in there with us. Uh, we've been on for a little bit more than an hour and, um, we appreciate it. And, uh, we'll be back, uh, with more programming. We have, uh, I think this week, uh, we will have David Levy joining us again. Um, so on an explore now, uh, talk. So we're, we're arranging that. We have some talks with uh, JPL scientists coming up. Um, and uh, we have uh, uh, Michael Fulbright also probably next week sometime. Oh yeah, maybe. us on, well, on this. Program, he's the right? developed the Indy driver for the PMC8. Right. He'll be able to talk about that. Right. And um, uh, who else? Oh, um, uh, Bob Actafreshi. He is a astrophotographer who does night sky photography. Um, he's world famous for it, uh, and is one of the official National Geographic photographers. Um, uh, he uh, started up a program called The World at Night, uh, which uh, has uh, books out and uh, a group of uh, incredible astrophotographers that do some amazing stuff that's so inspiring. So um, really looking forward to having him join our show. Uh, so, um, and I think that's it for us tonight. It's a wrap. <laughs> So Bye, everybody. Good night, everyone. Yep, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Yeah, let us know if we can help you. We're, we're here at any time. Almost any time. <laughs> it seems like we're here at any time. Yeah, I always check my email and stuff when I get up at night. So. Yeah, that's right. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.